Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today at the Draft and Robotics Talk Series. Just as a quick reminder, this and previously recorded talk can be found on our YouTube channel and website. Also, throughout the talk, please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. These will be answered during the Q&A panel at the end of the talk. With that being said, I would like to introduce today's <coughs> Dr. Kathleen Lee, Group Alum Stone Professor at the Computer and Science Information Department within the School of Engineering here at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for joining uh, our GRASP uh, seminar today. Uh, I'm uh, really honored to introduce to you uh, Professor Chad uh, Jenkins. Uh, he's a professor of computer science and engineering uh, at the University of Michigan and the associate director of the Robotics uh, Institute. Uh, I have known uh, Chad uh, since uh, his uh, time at uh, Brown. Uh, he has done uh, excellent uh, work here during his uh, PhD at uh, USC. As a matter of fact, I also remembered recently because uh, uh, doing a motion capture uh, 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 work these days is different than what uh, uh, Chad was doing, uh, using actually, but still using uh, embeddings. And uh, I really want to catch up with you about this. So he received his PhD at the uh, USC in 2003. Then he was a faculty at uh, Brown for 11 years. And uh, then uh, he joined uh, the University of uh, Michigan. Uh, he has uh, worked uh, starting actually with uh, uh, representations and embeddings from motion capture, but then later he's really one of the uh, leading figures on the human robot uh, interaction. Uh, when uh, his research crosses really uh, mobile manipulation, uh, perception, uh, as well as learning, in particular learning from demonstration. Uh, he uh, got uh, an amazing list of awards. He has been as everything that uh, a young faculty can uh, dream of. Uh, actually, uh, is, uh, uh, Chad has received. He received the PKs, the most prestigious awards, early career award, the presidential, uh, pretty much the presidential career, uh, the Sloan Research Fellow, he was a, he received the Young Investigator Award from ONR, the Young Investigator Award from the AFOSR, and of course the NSF. And uh, I really, uh, well, the whole community appreciates that uh, he was uh, the editor in chief. He is the editor in chief, he's the founding uh, member of the team that created the ACM transactions and human robot uh, interaction, the flagship uh, journal for the HRI community. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Association for the Advance Advancement of Science, and he's a senior member at IEEE at uh, ACM. And uh, I would like to finish uh, with, uh, I was really, I still remember uh, every day, in particularly since uh, last spring, uh, Chad's uh, talk, uh, uh, at, uh, he was invited speaker at the RSS in 2018. Uh, he was in one of the invited talks that uh, moved me most, probably uh, the talk that I have heard at the robotics conference during the last 10 years. And I think uh, not only me, but the whole community uh, uh, thank, uh, thanks you about it because you really changed the paradigm of thinking and taking a perspective on when we're doing research. Uh, Chad, please uh, go ahead. We are so honored to have you today at the Graph Seminar. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. This is, this is a huge honor. I thank you for all those uh, kind words and, and, uh, and the fabulous introduction. And even with all those awards, I'm still having trouble explaining dual quaternions to my students in class. So, so I still have a long way to go. Um, so I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to just, uh, just put myself uh, down here in the, in the, in the corner uh, really quickly. So I'm going to just move over to my, my slides here. Um, and just uh, put myself down here. And so, uh, so if you could spotlight my my video, then uh, then make sure that will just make sure that everybody can see it. And so, I just want to start off by uh, by asking everybody a question. Uh, you can you can consider it to yourself. So so this is me. Um, and so, what question do you think I get the most when I'm uh, when I'm just around in my daily life, uh, you know, walking around campus or whatever? Uh, think about it for a second. I'll take a quick sip of my coffee while you're doing that. 
All right. Uh, if you said, uh, are you with the football team? Then you have been right. Uh, and I, you know, and I usually say, and I usually say, you, if you think I'm with the football team, then you you may not know fo football players because they're really big. Uh, you know, there have you ever seen these guys? And just to give some calibration, uh, when I was in graduate school, I played rugby. That's what allowed me to keep my mind off of, uh, you know, keep my keep myself uh, in a good space. And so that's me. I'm not nearly even close to the biggest guy on the team. So uh, so just take that into consideration. Um, maybe what's the next most uh, frequent question that I get? Uh, think about it for a second. I'll take another sip. Uh, if you if you thought the next most question is when will I graduate? Uh, so I you know I'm 46 now. I still get this question a little bit, not as much as I used to get when I started as faculty, but uh, but but I still get it. And so my usual response to this is I'm 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 faculty in computer science. And um, and what I what I do is I, I actually build uh, I program autonomous robots. I don't build ro robots. I'm I'm not a great mechanical engineer, but uh, but I, I program autonomous robots. And um, the types of robots that I work with are like the the PR two that you see here. So this is this is the PR two that I had back at uh, at Brown University. And so we program this robot to to go around to do mobile manipulation tasks, learn from people, uh, and, and try to allow that robot to see so it can perform can perform these tasks autonomously. Um, and that usually, we do a lot of outreach. And so, so kids that come to my lab usually ask, is, is what I do a real job? They still see me as something different. Um, and I say, no, this, 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 is a, this is a real job, yes. And once they, they can maybe see themselves in that same picture, they start to ask me lots of, uh, lots of, lots of questions. Um, and, you know, will robots take my job? Will they, you know, um, you know will they be our friends? Uh, I mean, this is just a small sampling of the questions that I get. Um, but for this talk, I want to focus on three of these of these questions. Um, will my robots take over the world? Will robots take over the world? Where is my robot? And can can uh, can one of our robots bring you a drink? And so let me start off uh, by by saying uh, by asking, will robots take over the world? And uh, and no, robots are not nearly that smart. Um, we are we are still a, a long ways away from having from having anything close to resembling a robot that could that could think on its own. We program robots. We tell robots what to do. Um, and because we can do that, we can also make robots that that help humanity. Um, and so that can be one of the one of our one of the things that we prioritize because we choose what the robots will do. Um, and so as as Costas was mentioning, uh, one of the talks that, I, that I've given is uh, it was with Henry Evans. Uh, so this is a TED talk from a, from a few years back. Um, Although I will always remain jealous of the of the the, the number of talks that VJ has, a uh, number of light watches uh, VJ has for his quad rotor talk, which is one I share with my class all the time. It's a great it's a great one. You should not not measure ourselves by the number of views on our talks. I should say that, I, even though even though I'm still humbled. Uh, but if you watch this talk, you would see that uh, that we have um, that uh, that my colleagues at uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, Charlie Kemp in particular, started working with Henry Evans uh, along with Willow Garage. Um, Henry uh, suffered a stroke when he was about 40 uh, that left him without the ability to, to, to move, uh, except for his head and, and a little bit of his hand. He required uh, people to, um, to do his basic activities of daily living, uh, eating, hygiene, everything where he relied on, on his family and caretakers. Um, but what Henry was able to do, uh, along with, uh, with, with Charlie Kemp's group, was they were able to take some of the, the, the software that we had built, some of the network protocols for robots, and start to build interfaces, uh, web interfaces that were very accessible for Henry and his, his capabilities, uh, to be able to have him do some of these tasks on his own, uh, be able, to, um, be able to, to consume a meal on his own, uh, be able to scratch an itch. You know, if you, if, just think about the number of times that you just, you know, you have to scratch an itch on, you know, somewhere in your face or your body. Don't, don't do it in your face. We still have coronavirus. But, um, but, but, uh, but, but, you know, if you imagine all those times and you, and you, relied, you had to ask somebody to do that for you, that I think uh, that's, that's huge. This is the first time that Henry was able to shave himself uh, in, in, in about 11 years. And so I thought that was, I, you know, seeing this from afar and seeing our work be a part of this was really incredible. Um, and so uh, a lot of this, a lot of what uh, what what this built on is a uh, is a uh, um, is a a, pro a project that I that I helped found, which is the Robot Web Tools project. Uh, this is to to, to essentially build um, 
built a network protocol, an application layer network protocol that allowed for TCP IP like interoperability for robots. Um, and the core of this is the Ross Bridge protocol, which is a very simple messaging pro pro protocol that allows for any type of system to, to uh, talk with and work with a, a, a robot that's running the robot operating system, uh, Ross. Um, and so we, you know, so this is really the foundation for building these types of interfaces. But at the time, it wasn't web browsers that was the that was the big thing. It was actually having MATLAB be able to talk to uh, to, to to robots running ROS. But there's all sorts of other systems. And so I was really thrilled when uh, when Henry contacted one of uh, one of my colleagues and and asked if we could work together on a project. And and uh, and basically, what he wanted to do was fly drones. And I said, sure, we can make that happen. Um, and so I went out to the Brookstone and, uh, and I, was at, I was on sabbatical at Willow Garage at the time. Uh, Mark Yim was my, was my office mate, which was great. Um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and I went out to the, to, to the Palo Alto Mall and to the Brookstone. I bought an IR drone. I made it this, this interface that where you could see the camera from the, from the drone, the camera feed from the drone, nice big buttons that, that Henry could use. And, uh, and I made this in an afternoon and then we, then we went up to, to his house and, uh, in the hills of Palo Alto, and this was his his first flight, um, and so this was like uh, this was really amazing to see that he could uh, that he could he could fly this on his own. Um, uh, just the joy that he got from being able to move around on his own uh, through through one of these devices, I think was um, was just really was just really amazing. Um, he was a much more daring pilot. Uh, that, that I was. So, you know, he immediately took this out. Uh, you know, uh, he, he never had seen the solar panels on the top of his roof. He wanted to go see those, which was great. Uh, he wanted, you know, he can see his garden from afar, but he's never able to go right into the garden and, and see how, how things are growing. And so he, you know, so he, he did, he did this. My heart was like, uh, you know, uh, when, when he did this, I was like, all right, he's crashing for sure, but he didn't, you know, we had a few crashes, but like, but, but he was actually a fabulous pilot. Um, and so, uh, and so, this is just one example. We've been able to use Ross. People have used Ross Bridge and Robot Web Tools for a wide variety of applications. Um, and this is just a, a, a small, a small sampling. Um, and so, uh, and so, and you, you're, and it's, on, it's available. It's online. It's open source. If you have a need for for having uh, for some other application or some other system, talk with Ross. But you don't want to deal with Catkin. Uh, this is one easy way of of, deal, of doing this. Um, and so when I talk about this project, uh, you know, people say, oh, wow, that's cool or awesome or inspiring, or they, they make comments about, you know, this is like what I saw on that show Silicon Valley on HBO, and, and, uh, and that, that gives me a, 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 a you know, that, le that leads to some interesting discussion points. Um, but, uh, but usually that question is followed up very quickly with, uh, so where is my robot? We've done all this stuff. We, you know, you're a great roboticist, but but where is where is this going? And I usually would say that your robot is already here. Um, when you ask this question, autonomous driving, drones, uh, you know, robots in the in the in, uh, in the manufacturing space, um, you know, there, you know, these types, you know, robot technology is, is all over the place. But um, but usually when you think of robots, you're thinking of something. You know, people like to talk about Rosie the robot from the Jetsons. Uh, so what, what, when they're looking at those type of robots, what they're actually looking for mobile manipulation robots, robots that can move around human spaces, um, it, uh, work with objects, interact with objects, uh, dexterously manipulate objects at a human scale, work with our environments like the way we do as, as people. And so these, so my first purchase when I got to the University of Michigan was, uh, was a, a fetch robot manipulator. And so that's pictured uh, to the left here. And then there was the PR2 that we'd worked with previously at, at Brown. Um, just a real uh, a quick question. How much do you think these robots cost? Uh, you know, so, so think about that. Um, uh, you know, how, how much? So I'm gonna take another sip of coffee. Consider this like the price is right. I, you probably shouldn't be spending your time watching the price is right, but in the morning you should be more productive. But, but, you know, but try to guess how much one of these robots cost uh, you know, without going over. <laughs> um, and so you can think about that. I'm gonna take another sip. How much, right? Um, so, uh, so if we, if, in thinking about the answer to this question, we should lay it on, uh, on, on, on two axes. So you can, you can kind of see this here. Time on the, ver on the horizontal axis and cost on the vertical. And so if we lay this out, 
you know, I bought uh, the, the PR2 robot came out in, uh, in 2009. It cost about $400,000, which is more than most people's houses. Um, and then the Fetch, which I bought in, in 2015, was $100,000. If, uh, if we compare this to the first robot that I worked, worked with, uh, which is the, the NASA Robonaut, um, which I'm guessing, you know, my educated guess is about a million and a half dollars uh, when it came out around 2001. Um, if, we, if we remember from linear algebra, how to fit, uh, you know, uh, your favorite order polynomial to, to this data, we can see a trend, you know, trend polynomial that looks something like this, I'm going the wrong way still going the wrong way but um but um but that trend polynomial sort of suggests what we you know when you're when you would actually get a robot like this it would be affordable um and back when i originally wrote these slides in, in 2017 i guess that 2020 that this year would be the year that you would get your robot for about forty thousand dollars and so you're starting to see robots of you know this year there have been robots that have come out that are actually cheaper than this that are able to do mobile manipulation in, in various forms hello robot comes to mind as as one um but you know but what you're going to see is that with the economies of scale this is going to go cheaper and cheaper and cheaper they made about, I think, uh, about four or five NASA robonauts uh, at that cost. The PR2, they made about 60, um, you know, at $400,000. Fetch, I'm sure they're in the hundreds by now uh, at $100,000. And the next generation, as they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, will be, will be built likely in the thousands uh, if we find a good application for it. But this is just the robot platform. If we think about the autonomy that comes on board, on board this as well, um, it, you, we see different stages. So when I was a graduate student, um, robots were primarily remote control devices, right? Somebody would put a big head mounted display on and wear, wear motion capture suit and, we would, and they would control this robot. They couldn't delegate any tasks to the robot because you were really just replacing your embodiment for the robot's embodiment. But with, with the rise of uh, with laser range finding and other types of other types of sensors and advances in the platform, uh, we saw that you could that robots could start to do things like put that there, uh, take something, you know, navigate from location A and go to location B, or pick up object, uh, pick up an object at location A and take that lo that that, lo that object to location B. Um, and so, if you think about autonomous driving, it's sort of like one of the canonical examples of this, right? Uh, you get picked up at a at a particular spot, and the robot should drive you to uh, to your to your destination. Um, but where we're going uh, in terms of in terms of the research, the next uh, next thing we want to do is where a robot can do this task for me. Um, this is where you can where it's not you're not instructing the robot to do you know pick this object up and put it over here and then do this with this object with this action with this other object. You're actually able to do to delegate at a higher level. Be able to say robot, can you make me breakfast? Can you clean up the room? Can you assemble this uh, this this structure for me? Um, you know, can you you know basically give tasks to to the robot the same way that you could give to uh, to a human collaborator or human partner? And so when we think about this this uh, this uh, objective of can you do this task for me? What we're really asking is can we make the world programmable the same way that digital computing has made uh, has made information programmable and automatable? We're trying to do the same thing with the physical world. Um, and if we think about the, the difficulties in that, if we, if we take our robots here to the side and, you know, and we oftentimes think, think of the, the, the harshest environments as being you know, uh, the deep sea or, uh, or, a, or exploration on another planet, uh, I, I think you don't even have to go that far. I think the kitchen, just, the, just your everyday kitchen and the, thing, the, the variety of things in, that, in, in your kitchen and, uh, and the semantics of how you work with those objects, right? Every object, you don't, work, you don't just pick up every object, you actually have to use them in certain ways. The frying pan is meant, for, is meant to, to, to have a particular outcome uh, um, you know, uh, the, the, the chopping block, the, the, um, the sink, these all have form and function that we have to have to have to be mindful of. And so really, this is the next, uh, being able to work in environments like this is the next frontier. Um, and what we really want to be able to do is not just work in these environments, but have a general purpose uh, way of tasking robots in, the, in these types of systems. Um, our goal really is that we should be able to have, take an arbitrary robot that's physically capable of doing these tasks, um, be able to, to give them an arbitrary task, be able to specify that arbitrary task in some intuitive way and have them perform in any environment that we can think of. And this really, uh, and this goal of being able to have a general purpose engine, uh, a, a general purpose software stack 
uh, computation that allows arbitrary robots to perform arbitrary tasks in arbitrary environments really comes to the, the area of learning from demonstration. Um, and so when we think about learning from demonstration, I'd go back and I think about uh, the, the copy demo, this is sort of the origins of it. Uh, Patrick Winston back at the, at the, at the MIT AI lab, uh, you know, came up with the, this idea that, uh, that what we could do is you could have, uh, you could have somebody come up to a robot, uh, demonstrate a scene to a, to a robot, demonstrate a particular environment, uh, have the robot perceive that scene. So let's say you arrange these blocks in a particular way, uh, use computer vision and robot perception to be able to, to, to see how, you know, how, these, uh, how these, these objects come together to form a scene and then have the robot be able to reproduce, um, reproduce that, um, that scene uh, a, a, automatically. And so you're demonstrating what you want the robot to achieve and the robot can understand that. And, uh, and carry it out. And so really it's, it's starting to get to how do we understand what the human wants? What, what is their intention? And then being able to have the robot reason over, over what's needed to be done uh, to, to achieve that outcome and then execute that, uh, that plan. And so when we're thinking about this, this is really, you know, uh, this is sort of like the origins of, of learning from demonstration. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work with my colleague John Laird on a, on a, on a, on a survey paper uh, called Interactive Task Learning, which really lays this out and thinks of learning, thinks of it not just as learning from demonstration, but how do you give tasks to the robot? How do we build what we call taskable robots? Uh, and there's learning from demonstration is just one of these approaches. You could write, you know, you could just write C code to do to do a lot of these tasks. You know, that is taskability in some extent. There's cognitive architectures. There's all different ways of doing this. Um, and so, but what we're really trying to do is trying to, per, is trying to be able to, if we laid it out in terms of these axes, we want to be able to have robots be able to perform tasks, scale to new tasks, and then also be able to, to provide an ease of interaction for, for doing this. And so learning from demonstration provides one very good all, all option in this space. But what we want to do is start to move learning from, demonstra learning from demonstration out. Um, so if we think of learning from demonstration at this point, we want to get, we want to, push it out further along these axes where it can be more performant and more scalable. And that's the next generation robot learning from demonstration. And so what we're really trying to do with this is, is and I think my, I would suggest that, that there are a lot of things that we could do, um, you know, um, in that we could try to take uh, the, the advances that are happening in robot perception, what we call semantic mapping, and combine that with uh, declarative forms of programming, planning-based programming. So if you take your you know, autonomous reasoning and combine it with state-of-the-art robot perception, uh, then we could start to rethink robot learning from demonstration that is an extension of these origins, of the origins where this, this comes from. And so this is where my group is sort of working on in this area of what we're calling semantic robot programming. So coming back, what we want to be able to do is have just have a person go up go up to a robot, be able to demonstrate with arbitrary objects uh, in some arbitrary configuration, show this is a goal scene, this is what, what we want you to achieve. Uh, I, I don't trust neural networks, so I want to have com combination of neural networks and probabilistic inference to perform that perception. Um, and if we can, if we can uh, do that, then we can be able to, to estimate the scene that the robot's seeing and represent it in an axiomatic uh, description language, like uh, the planning domain description language. If the robot then can then, if robot remembers this goal, comes back and sees the same, uh, come back to the same environment, but sees objects in, you know, in a messy order or, or not representing the goal, it can try to achieve this goal by per perceiving this environment, representing it as a scene graph, and then doing planning using, uh, using your, your classical planning systems uh, to be able to reason over a collection of actions to get the robot, for the robot to do, uh, for the robot to achieve this goal. So in this case, the robot has perceived the current scene and now has is planned out a sequence of actions that will that will be able to uh, to achieve the goal scene. So it's putting some things away. Um, it's uh, it's being able to um, to uh, to stack things in a particular order to achieve this this scene. And so what's important about this is that all the reasoning that's happening for for the for the robot is done automatically. The only thing we, we did in the in this case is we just said that we just we just we only interacted with the objects the same way that I won't necessarily like you know if I want to demonstrate something to another person I'm gonna um, 
the same way that I won't, uh, I won't demonstrate something to another person by grabbing their arm and then moving their arm to certain, 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 certain places. Um, what I wanted, what I'll do instead is I will, I will just show them. I'm like, this is how you use, use the objects. And this is what, what you should do to perform the task. And so that seems more, more intuitive to me. Um, and so, uh, so this is just an example of the robot uh, 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 from a couple of demonstrations that are golden demonstrations are shown in the upper corner, uh, the robot achieving the, these goals. Uh, so we, we ran a number of tests this is just showing this uh, sort of Brady Bunch style. Um, and so, uh, so it, it works uh, a, a lot of the time. Um, but the thing that I sort of hand waved around was I didn't talk about the perception part because this only can work if our robots can, can perceive these environments. And so our difficulty is that we have to have the robots be able to per perceive and clutter. And so this, this, you know, this, uh, this, this creates some, some challenges um, in that we, have to, that we have to deal with occlusion, stacking, all sorts of physical, act, uh, physical um, interactions between the objects that creates uncertainty ambi and ambiguity in the inference process. Um, for this for, for this work at the time back in in 2018 we assumed that we know the whole ob we know the geometries for all the objects um, and what we want to infer are the pose of each object the six degree of freedom pose of these objects and their relationships which objects are supporting other objects um, and so in order to do this uh, we, we wanted to also ass not assume that we assume green screens like the one behind me uh, singulated objects. We don't want to assume anything about the color and appearance of objects beyond what we could learn, we could train up. And we didn't want to use AR tags. We want to do it as in situ as possible. Um, and to, and for this task, we took, uh, and for this, 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 uh, this problem of being able to do perception, we took, uh, we took a lot of inspiration from autonomous navigation. So this is a, this is a, a project from, uh, from my colleagues, uh, uh, Ryan Eustace and Ed Olson here at the University of Michigan. Um, where they were able to take laser range finding off of uh, the top of an uh, autonomous car they were building. This is actually from, I think, almost like five years ago, um, where, they, where they were able to build fabulous three-dimensional maps of space uh, using, the, using the late, this, just this laser range finder. And so, you know, what's, what you're seeing here are maps built of Ann Arbor. So in blue is the map that they've built up, and in red is, the, um, is what, the, what, what, the, what, what the robot's seeing at any time. Um, but the hard part of that is that we can't that we can, that helps us understand how space is occupied, but it doesn't help us understand the semantics of this space. Uh, of you know what is a tree? Or which parts of the scene this geometry is a tree or a building or another car or uh, if you can see it the the, the cyclists that are going to go through this the middle of that intersection. We have to treat all of these all these separately based off of their semantic uh, their semantic categorization. And so, but we're taking heart from this and that we think about the way this, uh, this, this, this uh, process goes, the control of, a, of autonomous car, uh, the localization, when we try to figure out what, uh, where this robot is, uh, we usually do that, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity with this. And so there, we use probabilistic methods to do this localization. Once we get an estimate from that localization system, then we can give that to a motion planning, uh, a motion planner that, that lays out the route and a motion control that actually controls the accelerator and the steering. And then those controls go back in and this loop continues over and over and over. Um, we wanna do the same thing for our, for our scene estimation problem. Uh, and, and, um, and, and when we wanna perform these manipulation tasks in semantic robot programming, um, similar to our localization problem for autonomous navigation, we have a scene estimation problem where we have to be able to um, we have to be able to take in, let's say, RGBD sensing, uh, color and depth, and then produce a scene graph as we've as we've, as we've discussed before. Um, and so, some of the work that we've done in order to do this uh, is essentially trying to combine in, in, in order to, to to make this process work. Has been, uh, and this is just sort of an example of this, is to try to be able to combine um, pro neural networks which are good at recognition with probabilistic inference. If we can do that, we can localize, we can try to recognize all the objects in a cluttered environment and then be able to, um, and then be able to, uh, to localize their pose and, and plant a grasp for that. So in this case, we're separating, uh, you know, once, we've, we, we, once, once we have this, we can recognize objects. And in this case, we're just, the semantics are objects that belong in the laundry basket, in the laundry room versus objects that can go anywhere in the house or another place in the house. Um, one thing you'll notice is that uh, that the robot correctly put downy, uh, which goes in the laundry room and the laundry bin, 
and it put but it put comet in the in the laundry bin as well which does not go there it goes in the kitchen uh, i don't think my students do enough uh, laundry or dishes to know the difference uh, unfortunately but the way that this system works in terms of perception is that we use neural networks to give us a first guess of what everything's out there in the scene and then we're going to use probabilistic, we're using to use that as sort of a prior or at least a starting point for probabilistic inference to come in and, and try, to, um, try to eliminate false positives and try to, try to match the geometry of, the, of, of, what we're, of, the, of our objects with respect to the scene. And if, we can, if that works, then we, then we have essentially a, a geometry that we can use to plant, to, uh, to plant a grasp and then pick up the object, knowing that we know what type of object that is. And so this is just seeing this, this process run out, of, run out a few times. In, in general, this, we just sort of see neural networks as a, as a good way to get an initial guess uh, so we can get the speed and recall of, of those neural networks to get, to get, uh, to get sort of, um, this is sort of the, the area of the inference space that we, that we want that we should explore. And then try our, our probabilistic inference methods uh, that you know, take much longer to run but are much more robust and much more explainable. Uh, to have the, those those systems work um, and, and sort of bootstrap those systems so they so we don't take on their worst case and so this marriage of uh, of, of discriminative and generative methods is sort of what we've been working on um, and so so what we've been facing are a number of of, of challenges I, I um, you know for semantic robot programming so you know a lot of those basically get towards how can we make probabilistic probabilistic inference, inference faster uh, i truly truly believe or i would I, I would conjecture that probabilistic inference similar is ready for a renaissance similar to what neural networks uh, went through 15 years ago uh, but that means that we have to think about the systems aspects of, of the, this types of inference um, and we have to make it faster uh, we you know the same way that gpus and lot massive amounts of data uh, allowed neural networks to perform at the level that we've come to expect and, and uh, appreciate. Uh, those, how do we make, uh, how do we start to develop software and hardware systems that make, uh, make methods like non-parametric belief propagation really fast? Um, our world are, is dominated by trans, transparent and translucent objects, such as, uh, such as uh, glassware, um, just the you know the glass panels and buildings, um, all sorts of all sorts of things, um, and so we've been working on on using uh, planoptic light field cameras in order to to do uh, to do estimation of uh, of these types of objects. Um, afford I haven't talked a, a lot about affordance and the semantics of, of working with objects, and so that's an active project we have in our lab as well. And uh, and if you saw our work from from ICRA um, uh, this this year, uh, we want to start to move beyond sort of the tabletop environment, not just maintaining a, a perception of what the robot can see, but also things all throughout the building that we that we may not be able to see directly, observe directly, but we know are out there. And we need to make, maintain belief about where those objects could be. So if, if you said, if you told the robot, you know, can you bring me a cup of coffee? It shouldn't have to search the whole building to find a coffee mug. It should know it's probably in the kitchen. Um, so with that, I, uh, I want to get to, you know, talking about coffee mugs makes me think that we should, you know, can your robot bring me a drink? Um, and, you know, and my, my response to that is, uh, is sure. Uh, no problem, but usually for a roboticist, I've been to enough ICRAs and IROSs to know that drink actually means beer. Um, if you're if you're not 21, it still means soda for you. But uh, but you know, let's, let's say your robot can bring you a drink, and, and sure, that's no problem. We've done that done that many times, um, and so this is just something that robot roboticists do. We bring drinks to people um, all over the place. Um, and when people see this, they say, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, and that's usually when I get the most references to, to Silicon Valley. Like, have you seen Silicon Valley? I, you know, it's like what I saw in this episode and, and so forth. And it leads to some good, some interesting conversations. And, and so in this show, uh, it's about uh, a Silicon, this, the, the rise of a Silicon Valley startup. And, you know, and what they show is a lot of times these startups are a lot of places and in big technology sort of, you know, they say whatever that is they're, whatever it is they're doing, uh, for their company is making the world a better place. So, for instance, if you are uh, if you are you are making the world a better place through elegant code hierarchies uh, for maximal code reuse and extensibility. Uh, all right, uh, one that I liked was uh, making the world a better place through scalable, fault tolerant, distributed databases with acid transactions. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, uh, one that that hit home to me though. Uh, was was from the, the the CEO of a of a big one of the big sort of uh, con, you know.
big tech, uh, fictional uh, tech companies uh, called Hooli. Um, and so Hooli, the, the CEO of this, this, this company, which, which had sort of a, you know, a, a tenuous, group with, tenuous grip with, uh, with morals or what, what, it, what they would call tethics, uh, tech ethics, um, basically the CEO said uh, that Hooli is about making the world a better place uh, through minimal message oring transport layers. And I was, and I, I saw that, and this, this is in the first episode of Silicon Valley, and it really hit home because if you replace Hooli with Rossbridge, which I talked about earlier, then really you're talking that I, that I could be saying the same thing. You know, that could be me, that I'm, I'm just saying, you know, I could be saying some vacuous thing about my work is just making the world a better place. And how do I actually verify that? How do I, how do I know? How am I accountable? Um, you know, am I actually making the world a better place? Um, and that's a difficult, you know, and the answer to that is actually a very difficult question. It requires some soul searching. Um, and, you know, and I think a lot of this for, you know, you know, I gave the essence of this talk two years ago, but for a lot of people, this really came home uh, Memorial Day of this year when we saw what happened with George Floyd. And, you know, I, I mean, even just now, if you try to hold your breath for eight minutes, you know, it's, you know, it gives you a sense of the sorrow and the, the agony that, that he went through. And, and this is a lot of pain. Um, and, you know, and so this, you know, for in computing, this led to a lot of people trying to think about what are we doing? How can we make things, uh, make things better? How can we address these systemic issues? Uh, one thing that I was a part of was the blackandcomputing.org open letter, which sort of gave, a, gave you know, a sense of how people were feeling at the time and things that you could do as an individual or, or, a, or an organization or a community. Um, and so, uh, so that, that was one thing, but for me, uh, it was still very abstract what we should do as a computing and engineering and robotics community. But, it, it, but when I learned of the events of January 9th uh, of this year, which was my 46th birthday, um, then things became a lot more clear for me. Uh, on January 9th, uh, that's when, uh, when Robert Williams uh, was, fall, was, was wrongfully arrested based off of a pure facial recognition result. Um, so basically, uh, Robert Williams, who lives in Farmington Hills, which is not far from me, uh, he was he was uh, Detroit police ran his uh, ran his ran his face through a through a, um through a uh, through a, um through a facial recognition system for a crime that was committed, and it wrongfully came up as him. Um, and so so basically, they took this this grainy image of some of the actual perpetrator critic committing a crime, ran through facial recognition, and arrested this poor man. Um, you know, and so, uh, so I, I think um, I think he tells his story best. Uh, so I mean, sorry, but I think he tells his story best. So you should, uh, you should, you should. I would, I would welcome. I would uh, re recommend going to the ACLU site and and seeing the and seeing the video. I think it's very powerful. Um, but the reality still remains is that he was uh, he was arrested in front of his kids, his wife, his neighbors, people that that uh, that that um, that respect him. And uh, and was detained for 30 hours purely based off of of a wrong result in facial recognition. It's you know, and he's and there's many more cases that, than than uh, many more cases like his that are that are coming to light. Um, I would also recommend reading his uh, his article in the Washington Post. Uh, you know, this talks about facial recognition technology, but we're not just talking about facial recognition. This could be any decision system, one for our robot, or one for an admission system, or hiring system, financial lending decision, anything. You have to be careful of what we're doing with these uh, artificial intelligence systems, um, because if you take if you're looking at, at what happened in this case, where you had a grainy image and you're trying to make a you're trying to to make a result with confidence from this. Um, you know, the same thing has done has done over the summer, where they took a grainy image of President Obama and clear and tried to upscale it, tried to to, uh, to perform super resolution on it, try to upscale the resolution, and it clearly that's that the result is not President Obama. So, um, so I, I think it gets to some of the biases that we have in our in our systems. Um, I, one uh, uh, Turing Award winner, we're on the clue, uh, correct and from a technology perspective, correctly said, well, if you you train the system on on people that are Caucasian, then then this is the result that you should get, and so it's not really an issue with their systems. But I think what he's missing is he's not understanding that who's in the room to train these these neural network systems, who's in the room to train this AI. 
because uh, that makes a big difference in how these systems perform. Even if you're right from a technology perspective, you may not be right in terms of a societal impact uh, perspective. Because when you're looking at who's training these systems, you know, there's a history of being able of, of not having diversity in the room. And if you don't have diversity in the room, uh, when you're coming up with the research ideas and you're uh, you're coming up with the I um when you're coming up with the, when you're developing the systems and you're putting them into practice, that's when we have systemic problems. That's when we have uh, when we have bad impacts on society. Society. Um, I would also say that this hits our our community as well. Uh, if we look at if you go to the tableau that that uh, the Georgia Tech has put out uh, for for uh, for papers that have appeared in ICRA, uh, you know this is from 2019. Uh, you can see that deep learning, just in terms of the numbers of papers and number of published authors in the area, is far and away the most subscribed area of robotics right now. Um, and if you look back at 2018, 2017, 2016, this was not the case. This, we, we may be overfitting in how we're thinking about the world uh, from a research perspective. Um, and I would say that we have sort of, we failed, AI has failed, uh, failed uh, systemically in terms, of, in terms of this change. Um, because what we've done is in our, in traditionally in our AI research, we have very few and marginalized uh, black AI researchers. Um, and because researchers uh, not just produce ideas, uh, they also produce future researchers and they also train the, the next generation in the classroom, the undergraduate and graduate classroom. And we've just seen low production of blacks with CS degrees that could go and work in the workforce and help, uh, and, and help provide the diversity that when we start to develop the systems that go into end use, uh, that we can provide a, a better education, uh, better wisdom for, for how these systems will be used. Um, I would say that there are uh, there are great people that study what I call the front end problem, which is you know how these technologies are used, how we're thinking about that from from you know from the sort of um, from their sort of uh, from their development from a development cycle to the to the um, to act to their actual use. Um, but what I care about as as somebody who's in higher education is the, what I call, call the back end problem, which is how many people are be, are coming through in terms of the research lab and the, and the system development. And so one thing I'm proud of my department for doing this year is starting an annual diversity report to track how many people we're getting through, uh, through this program who are, who are trained and ready to be a part of the, of the, of the, the AI workforce and the AI, uh, the AI, the AI thought sphere uh, to be able to, to have an influence and, and be able to provide the diversity that we desperately need. Um, one thing I should also say is I took this picture from uh, from Viola Jones uh, facial recognition paper, and I don't blame Viola Jones at all because if you look back at their paper, Figure Eight, uh, you know they have diversity in the faces they're looking at. This is not really an issue of any particular research. It's about the, how the and and or, or any individual. It's about how the system works on the whole, the way we're incentivized, and the way we practice artificial intelligence. And so with that, you know, to just trace back to see how we've failed to include black people in the advances of artificial intelligence. Uh, I would highly recommend reading the, the, the book by Nils Nilsson, uh, The Quest for Artificial Intelligence. This actually is a fabulous book. I had, uh, I was fascinated by reading it. It basically goes from the origins, you know, the over the, the, the origins of artificial intelligence over the, over the histories to when it really was catalyzed in the, uh, you know, in the last, in the, in the, um, in the, in the 20th century. And, and really the funding and the, uh, and the people are name dropped about how they, how they played a role. Um, but if you read this book and, and you're inspired by it, you also are a little depressed by it because you realize there are no black researchers who are cited or name dropped. It, it basically says we've had no impact on the field. Um, if we look in terms of the workforce, we can see uh, that there are, there are pretty big disparities in terms of the, um, in terms of the ethnic background uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, gender background of, uh, of, of people having to represent in the population and how it doesn't, it's not really reflected in the tech sector. Um, from a civil rights perspective, uh, we would call this uh, a disparate impact. That means uh, a different impact is, 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 um, is different than disparate treatment. Disparate treatment says that there's explicit rules that segregate or exclude uh, people from different opportunities or uh, based off of their, their, um, their demographics. Uh, disparate impact says that everybody can, can come in and have an opportunity, but the system, the outputs of the system are, are creating disparities. And so there might be something inside of the system that is, that is, creating, uh, that is creating impacts that, uh, that are biased. And so we have to look at these as indicators 
um, as, as how the system is performing, how we're performing. Um, and because if we don't do this, there will be, there is a, there is an effect that we have in that if that, you know, even if we're well-meaning, but we don't address these sort of biases that we have internally, um, then we're, you know, then we, the, our outputs, the products that we make are going to have those biases and lead to, lead to bad outcomes. Um, you know, all you have to do, if you're thinking about next week, all you have to remember is Cambridge Analytica. It doesn't, you know, it's not just racial biases. It's just, you know, what's incentivizing you. Um, and so, you know, these things are good to think about globally, but when you're actually thinking about what do you need to do, what can you do, you know, you want to think global, but act local, what can you do to be a, to be a better citizen? And so uh, really, I'm just, I would just suggest as a first step, just understand how our system works, how, what drives our, our system. Um, and, you know, and this is something that, that we should know how we sort of operate as researchers. Um, in that what we do if we want to, if we want to succeed, and, and this is sort of a cynical take on it, so, but, you know, so, so take that for what it's worth, but I think there's uh, some kernel of truth in it, is that if we want to succeed, we want to create a bubble of competence around us that, um, that, that you know, of, of, that exudes success and gives a perception that we are competent and really puts on, puts on a good, uh, good, good veneer. Uh, we use this, this, uh, this, these appearances to make us, to get our proposals funded, get investment, and produce results from that investment. We form alliances of like-minded researchers that think the way that we do and, and, you know, and, and think about the world and the, and the problem space and, uh, uh, the, in, in a similar way. We collude to, to promote the views of the alliance while dismissing a, a dissenting views that, that don't agree with ours. And then, uh, and then we use the patronage that we've built up uh, to, to, then, uh, to then place the people that come from our, our labs into, into positions of influence in academia and industry and, the, and in the public sector. And then uh, we use that patronage to then get more funding and more people. And then we rinse, wash, repeat. Um, and so that same cycle that we have of how to, have, how to be successful in research is also used by law enforcement and that police officers you do this to, 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 uh, to, build, uh, to build unions and then make those unions uh, uh, you know, strong enough that they don't have to be accountable. Law enforcement is really important. Our society cannot work without, without law enforcement, without some way to make sure that everybody is adhering to the rules and making sure that everybody's rights are, 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 um, are kept in order. But law enforcement without accountability is dangerous. And that is what we're seeing right now. And so research without accountability is also dangerous too. And so I wanted to make that point. Um, what can you do? So Costa talked about the talk that I gave uh, back at, at, uh, at RSS. Um, and so I, these, were the, these, were mostly, these were the same suggestions I gave back then. Um, and so, um, so what can you do? You can, uh, you can just look around and, and look locally and see what's happening. Are you consistent with the people that are with your colleagues, uh, people who are you know, your, your senior and junior colleagues, do you treat them fairly? Uh, you're consistent with how you treat your students, but also the people that want the opportunities that are coming your way, you know, with the applicants to your, to your programs. When you're looking at, in terms of your daily existence, how diverse is your research lab? And I've been fabulous. It's been great to see how Penn has really stepped up and, and you know, the diversity at Penn has been fabulous to see uh, in, your, in the graduate programs. And, and, uh, and so, so I, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated that. Uh, but it's also not just demographic, but if you look at your citation list, if you're citing the same types of people over and over and over again, you know, that's not really diversity. You know, look at your classroom or your committees. If you can eliminate the double standards in, in terms of how you're thinking about that, uh, these, these dimensions, then you can also eliminate the disparate impact. But there were a few things that I forgot, um, which were how diverse is your funding review meeting? You got to be able to invest in people, you, you know, so, you know, are you, are you investing, uh, you know, are, are you really investing in black people that can, that can succeed in the field? Um, I would say that are your curriculum needs, when we look at the curriculum uh, that, that we offer, it still sort of has a 1990s mindset where we sort of have electrical engineering and from a computer science perspective, there's electrical engineering, computer science and computer engineering in the middle. But like, does that people give people a pathway into robotics? Um, you know, I, I, and, the, and this model was before AI became big, before uh, big technology. Um, just as a highlight, we're trying to do something about this at Michigan where, where we're trying to input a, 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 a new undergraduate program for, for robotics. My, the basics of this is start with linear algebra, make, the, make uh, instead of calculus, 
start with the fun stuff and make it accessible. Um, provide a threaded curricular model that allows students to find their path into AI and robotics. Um, and then lastly, just I wanted to talk about how we incentivize equal opportunity in computing. I would just say that we need to, that if we, if we live up to the civil rights uh, legislation that we have, uh, that, that I think we would address these concerns directly. Civil Rights Act in 1964 says that any organization receiving federal funds, including universities that, get, that receive research grants, if you have to produce equitable outcomes, you have to look and see who are you producing and are they, are they able to achieve in the workforce? And if you can do that, then, then, that, uh, then that means that, that, um, that you can have those, uh, that, you know, that you're ready for, um, that you're eligible for, for federal funding. Uh, I can say that uh, that the that Title IX has has created an environment that allows for uh, that Title IX, which says that women uh, have equal should have equal access, or I should say, people of of one sex should have equal access to anything at a university that that uh, that uh, people from another sex should have. So that's why you have both a men's basketball team and a women's basketball team, but it also applies to many other dimensions across higher education. Um, and so Title IX really has has done a lot for our environment. Uh, academic environment over the decades. And so I'm gonna skip that joke. Um, and so just in general, computing needs more empathy. Our work has real consequences. That really is one of the main messages I have. We should be committed to, to innovation and excellence. We should balance that with our needs for to, to, to ensure that we have equal opportunity and make sure that both of those are enabled by the economic incentives that we, that we have in our field. And if we can do that, we can get to this nice intersection point that's really where we want to be as a, as a society. So with that, I'll stop there and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Chad. Uh, really, it is really very inspirational. Uh, one more time also after RSS, uh, it uh, really touched us. And uh, I really appreciate uh, that you bring this perspective in the technical talks and I really also, I urge uh, all colleagues actually to uh, do that. Uh, it really it can affect the life of uh, uh, many students and postdocs and uh, the outcome of their careers. I will, uh, we have uh, a, a panel, dis uh, discussion panel, which is led uh, by two of our PhD students. Uh, uh, Abriana Stuart Hyde is uh, in electrical and systems engineering, PhD student, and uh, Rebecca Lee is in mechanical engineering, uh, PhD student uh, as well. And they have collected uh, questions and they're going to lead uh, uh, the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much for this talk. And I'd like to remind everyone that there is a Q&A section. If you wanna ask a question, please ask it there. Um, thank you for this wonderful talk. You've covered everything from like football players to social justice to semantic robot programming, which is really impressive in an hour long talk. Um, uh, but I kind of wanted to ask a question about something that you had mentioned a little bit earlier and that you had done um, uh, kind of tying together some of these ideas. Um, you worked a lot with Rossbridge and this is like an open source project and stuff like that. And in terms of um, the robotics community, we really like open source projects that make um, a lot of our research really accessible. But that also means that, you know, anyone can use our projects and, but it does like also give more people access to like doing that. So if you wanted to comment on like, you know, um, kind of how that's influenced your work. Yeah, I think, um, so Rossbridge really came from sort of how I view science um, in that I, I think science is really about um, never believing anything anybody says and being able to do it yourself. Uh, you know, science is, is believing, right? I, science is, means that doing is believing. And so I, you know, so with the rise of Ross um, and, you know, Rossbridge is really just to give people a chance to to, to, to take what we do in our lab, what we talk about in our papers and reproduce them on their own. Because, uh, because that really to me is the, is the essence of science. I, am, I, I think it, it's hard to be a scientist and not be open source at the same time because that's really, that, that is really what we, what we do. This talk uh, I gave is about, um, gets to the bottom line of what we do in, in academia. We produce two things and uh, two main things. We produce new ideas and new understanding and we produce people. And, you know, and so that really is, you know, that those I, the ideas have to be open source and the people have to be diverse. And that's, I think that's, uh, that's the essence of it.
Thank you. Um, I just want to say, like, you know, following up off of Rebecca, it was an incredible presentation, learned a lot of different things. Um, and um, while we wait for more people to send in questions, I guess I will also ask a question of my own. Um, so I guess I wanted to talk more about SRP um, and kind of what kind of goes into that decision uh, process when you guys decide what is a landmark object for what your target object is? And um, like, how would you use this approach um, in more outdoor human, common human environments? Right. Um, so, you know, I would say that the, the perception system we talked about was still very, very rudimentary <laughs> back, back then. Uh, I mean, I think it was, it was great. It, it did a lot of, it did a lot of, a lot of things that we, what we wanted. Um, but you know, but really, it's um, but the objects you know are sort of still rigid objects. There, you know, that we're doing, we're taking pick and place actions on them. And but the main thing that you that I think you're getting to is we show one demonstration of one scene, and we're really just reproducing that scene. What we're trying to build up towards is understanding, uh, essentially, get a space, a, a set of the the satisfying conditions that the user is trying to trying to express trying to express. Um, you know, so they may give multiple demonstrations. They may give demonstrations in different contexts. They may be giving, and multiple people might be giving these demonstrations. And so what we're trying to extract from them is, you know, not necessarily here's a particular scene that to reproduce, but what are the conditions that need to be met that would, that would satisfy the goal? And that still is, you know, I, I think that's, that's still on the frontier of what we're trying to, trying to understand. Um, we have recent work that we, that will be in submission soon that that models this problem as a as a factor graph to try to to try to think about what are conditions that need to be need to be met um, that that a user is trying to express. But it's still, I, I think there's just a lot of lot of new ideas to to that we need to generate in this space. Actually, I have a kind of a follow up question to that, and that um, a lot of the times, like you won't be able to like figure out the conditions and stuff like that, and you'll want your robot to actually interact and figure out like, okay, like if I have a jar and it's like an opaque jar, like how how full of it is is it with like sugar or something like that, so I can figure out a grasp. Have you investigated some of that more, like you know, interacting with the environment to figure out what's going on? Right. Time? As you said that, I realized I didn't answer half of Abriana's question which about which is about outdoor environments. I I apologize. <laughs> but let me let me say that. Um, that uh, let, I'll take your question first, and that uh, that dealing with fluids and granular media are still very difficult. I wouldn't want my robot to be anywhere near sand or water or anything like that. Um, and we're very careful when we do it, um, and partially because because uh, being able to perceive those types of those types of, of objects, you know, I, I took you know our work with trying to perceive transparent objects uh, is you know stems directly from work that we've seen from 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 Penn uh, in this area, and so. Um, and so transparency in of uh, transparency for rigid objects is hard, but then when you have water that's moving around that has caustics and all sorts of other visual effects, uh, you know, how, what, how do you sense that phenomena and how do you know how, 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 you know, how it's moving and that, you know, that's water, sand, all, all types of things like this. If you try to move to outdoor environments, then it's still really difficult because now you have, uh, most of what we see in nature is non-rigid, right? You have soft objects, trees, blow in the wind, um, you have sand and dirt and dust. Um, but, for, but once you can perceive these objects and you know you can represent them in terms of scene graph or some sort of, uh, some sort of way of characterizing their belief, then you fit nicely into this, into what, how we're thinking of semantic robot programming. Because really it's about, you know, how do you take the state estimate from the perception system and then be able to be able to and uh, and and then that state estimate from the perception system to represent the current state, have some way of characterizing the goal states and then giving that to a decision to some sort of planner or decision making system that can that can produce actions uh, that would lead you to uh, to just to satisfying that goal. But but really, I think what we're talking about are a lot of perception problems. Um. Thank you um, for that answer. Um, so we have some questions from the audience. The uh, first one is from Dr. Taylor. It says, what things do you think R1 universities like Michigan and Penn could do better to engage and train a diverse group of students? Right, um, I, I think, uh, well, I think I just wanna say this and that um, first I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna always say the embarrassing thing about CJ that when I was a graduate student, uh, seeing CJ and the work that he did at Berkeley always gave me inspiration. 
Um, you know, I was like, wow, there's somebody else who's like me who's actually succeeding in this field. Uh, and so CJ has always been a, a big role model for me. Um, but uh, in terms of R1 universities, I am grateful that both Michigan and Penn are, you know, we're, we are, we are, we are moving the needle in, in this regard. And so I'm very grateful for, for being at the University of Michigan. I'm grateful for speaking at Penn because, you know, because you have, because uh, you can see that, that, that change is, is, is coming um, and that, that we're, that's happening. Um, but to better engage, I think that means that we have to, we have to take some risks on some people uh, who may not fit the part. Uh, I think that that's part of it. We have to be more open-minded. Um, I think connecting with, with schools that, that are undergraduate programs that are producing people, uh, you know, I believe there are a number of Meyerhoff scholars at Penn, and, you know, so I think that that's helpful. Um, but also, I think, to me, like one of the biggest things that, you could, that we can do is rethink our undergraduate curriculum. Um, I, I think if we're, if we're we, we are killing kids right now with four semesters of calculus and um, and discrete math and really pathways that you know that that emphasize uh, that emphasize you know we're going to teach you a bunch of things that you need just in case you go into AI and robotics instead of teaching them AI and robotics which gets them excited and interesting and then providing a thread that allows them to learn all the all the things that they need but but inspire them first I very worry very much worry that we have a lot of students so if you take diversity out of the picture you just look at first robotics we have a lot of students that are inspired that do first robotics in high school and then they get to college and they're like well where, where's the robots how do I how do I learn about this and and they have to sit in class until really their third or, or fourth year in the program before they start doing robotics and I think that's a wasted opportunity um, so I really think the undergraduate curriculum is one of the biggest things that we can do to get the pipeline to, to you know to, to to get more diversity in our in our field. Thanks for that answer. Um, it's really interesting. So kind of switching gears a little bit more towards the funding side. Um, some people are asking, uh, robotics research is funded in large part by military organizations. How do you feel this should be considered when we think critically about um, how is our work making the world a better place? And I think this also ties into one of the later questions about like who should be the benefactor of robotic technologies? Right, right. Um, I think that's a, that is a, that's a fabulous question. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what, you know, for a lot of American universities, we are, you know, we are beneficiaries of the of of, of, of the, what the American taxpayer is willing to give us, and we sort of have to care. We, we don't get money for for free. If you want to change how we how we distribute money, uh, distribute funding to universities, you have to convince people and politicians to to you know to um to appropriate the money differently. Um, and so I think that that is a, a big concern. I believe the Department of Defense budget for robotics is just a lot larger than it is for National Science Foundation or um, and other sort of basic science, uh, other sort of general non-defense uh, non-defense agencies. And so, uh, so it really is. We have to we have to do a better job of communicating what our you know what we want. I personally have no problem taking Department of Defense money. I worry much more about big tech. I worry much more about big multinational companies that are unaccountable for the most part. I worry about them more than I, than I worry about the Department of Defense who, who, ha, who sits on, who, who, is, who is commanded and controlled by, uh, by, a civilian, uh, uh, by, by civilian politicians. Um, and so, you know, so if, you know, if anything, um, you know, there is accountability that can happen. That's not to say that, that abuses aren't there and there, there are bad things that happen uh, through, through military use of, of these types of systems. But we have, but we have, we as a as citizen, citizenry have a chance to, to hold the, the Department of Defense accountable in a way we can't do corporations. Um, but to the same extent, I worry that that I worry greatly that there is such a um, that with the rise of drones and all of these this technology that um, that if we don't put um, you know something like the Geneva Convention in place. Uh, this is it's going to it's going to massively um, magnify the speed and scale at which lethal force is uh, is is taken upon uh, is, is taken upon uh, between between state actors as well as uh, state actors against uh, against uh, let's say dissidents and, and, and things like that and so um, so I think we as a robotics community really need to think a lot about how we. Um, you know how our technology could be used to in you know in terms of uh, in terms of lethal force. Oh, and I should also forgot to say Tom Williams 
led a, a great uh, open letter as well. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, no justice, no robots. So, so I would leave it, Tom is much better at, uh, he's at the Colorado School of Mines. He has thought much more about the ethical impacts, ethical concerns of robotics than I have. And I, I, would, uh, I would highly recommend reading some of his, his writings. Thank you for that. Um, definitely check out um, his writing. Um, so we have some questions uh, a little bit more, I guess, technical. Um, so from uh, Michael Sabrapera, we have um, that you um, talk, talking about um, Ross Bridge, um, and he's saying that there is a lot of other utility software for robot that robotics could use, um, but finding the time, I guess, to investigate and see if you can use them is hard. So how do you, as an academic, justify the time and effort? for infrastructure work of that type and how could our field better encourage that sort of development? Right, I love that question. Thanks for being a Rossbridge user. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I think I did, I did Rossbridge out of just sheer intellectual curiosity and like, how do we get robots on, on, the, on the web? I, I, um, I did not, I mean, it, it was, it's an open source project. I have very little funding for doing that. I get very little academic reward for that. Um, it's, you know, it's not that it's like that, that the field, um, that the, that the field, uh, you know, is, is hostile to things like that. You know, I think, I think the, if we look at the, at the, at the, at the evolution of robotics, there was a time when people would just make a demo of, of a, of a system and they would implement, a, implement something in code and it would just be some one-off system that didn't work and didn't really help anybody. Um, and so I think there's we have to guard against that, but at the same time we have to we have to also make sure that we don't float too far into the theory without being being grounded in, into some practical problems. Um, how we do, how we how we cultivate this is really I think by you know I, I think it's really by being able to to reproduce each other's ideas. I think um, I'm I'm heartened to see that in a lot of of our academic venues, we start. We are now incentivized. We're now sort of have uh, have tracks for reproducibility. We have tracks where you have to. You are, there's ways for you to upload your code, upload your data, so that others can can um, can reproduce what what you've done for your, from your systems. Uh, it's easy to do that for computer vision or machine learning because you're excuse me, because it can all be done in software. Um, but, uh, but for robots, it's hard because you have to have the robot, you have to re replicate the physical environment. Um, you know, I, I think that that requires investment. Uh, the thing that we really need to do is we, you know, in addition to having more investment for diversity that tied with, with our core funding programs, uh, to have a more to fund a more diverse set of individuals, we also need so much more investment from the, from the country uh, to to have to develop the infrastructure needed to build the next generation of robots and have them tested so that we can get feedback about how well our math our methods actually work. It all comes down to reproducibility in the end. Uh, time for just one or two more questions. Um, so the next question is back on the technical side. So you've made a great case for learning from demonstration. What role do you see for learning from experience in um, open world environments? Right. Um, I, I think it's it's going to be. Uh, oh, I, I'm going to try to answer this as, as succinctly as possible because this is this is a 20 minute discussion over, that I hope to have uh, over coffee with CJ someday post pandemic. Um, but but really, what we have to be able to do is start to think about um, in open world environments. We we're going to have to start characterizing the affordances that go that that are associated with different objects. And we're going to have, have to have attention mechanisms to say, of all the things that are in this environment, I have to block out most of that to just focus on the objects that I need for a, to, to, to perform a particular task. And, and really, when we're talking about learning from demonstration or any of these things, we're talking mostly about pro, uh, how we do the, 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 the sort of analogy of programming languages research for, for robotics and, and real world environments. A lot of these things could be done by hacking C code and with Roth and Kacken. It could be done by learning from demonstration. It could be visual programming. It could be a number of different ways. And we just don't spend a lot of time discussing those programming aspects of what we, of what we do with, uh, with in, in our work. And so as robots get out and do more, we will, we will probably have more, uh, more discussions about, about these programming languages and how you would actually say, say to a robot, here are the items that you need 
to do this task and let me show you how you use them together to, to, to accomplish the task. And I think that really is still, that's still on the horizon for us to address as a, a challenge in, in, in research. Um, but you know, but I, I, I would imagine someday soon that there will be a robot programming languages research area that would, that would, uh, that would talk about this. Gabby. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Ty, Hoftas, the panelists, and everyone for joining us here today. Um, please tune in next week. We have a very special uh, seminar speaker. Um,